there seem to be more and more images of babies wherever I look. And it has its reasons. It basically has two reasons. You, are you, you want to hear me? Do you want to hear me? Okay, thank you. No, it's, no, it's coming. Yeah. There seem to be images of babies wherever I turn, more and more. And it has its reasons. Yes, one reason is that uh, my oldest daughter is pregnant. Yes, I'm going to be a grandfather. So, <laughs> and um, so uh, pictures from ultrasounds and uh, that sort of thing is turning up on Facebook, my Facebook page, and images of a pregnant, pregnant young woman. But then, then, of course, my wife got a new job a couple of months ago, and that is in a maternity ward. So she comes home with sort of Christmas lights in her eyes in the evening and says, guess what I did today? And then uh, the story is about babies and about, you know, fathers, young fathers crying their eyes out looking at this most beautiful baby ever born. And the uh, story is about also the the pain of, of birth sometimes. Um, and then we end up sitting at home in the evenings looking at one born every minute, if you know the series, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen to us soon and uh, that sort of thing. And it's, uh, I, I, so I go to bed and I dream about being pregnant. <laughs> so, um, um, but it's kind of nice though. Um, <laughs> Not being pregnant, but uh, the whole thing. Um, I was um, then relating to what I'm going to talk about a little later. What is more important? That's kind of a stupid question, isn't it? What is more important, the pregnancy or the baby? And of course, the pregnancy wouldn't be there if there wasn't a baby, and the baby wouldn't be there if there wasn't a pregnancy. But what makes the pregnancy important? The baby. What makes the baby important? The baby. Um, forgetting that, I, I'm, today I'm, I need to take you uh, with me on the sort of journey that I did when I was preparing this talk. Because it started sort of way back in April or May. And I started with a text from John, John 15. And maybe, if I'm lucky, this will follow me. It doesn't. There it comes. With your help, thank you very much. Um, where Jesus is talking about him being the vine, the true vine, and we are branches. And he says very plainly that if I am in you and you are in me, you will bear much fruit. And without me, you can do nothing. So I started uh, to reason and think about this, and then I, I took this expression in me, and I said, I'd like to follow that into more of the scriptures. And I started to read Paul. And Paul uses the phrase, in Christ, 84 times in his writings. And I went through them all, and I added when he says, under Christ, through Christ, with Christ. And then suddenly I, I discovered something that I found kind of strange. Because this phrase, in Christ, which probably relate to, also relates to in me, it comes in sentences that would make perfect meaning without the phrase. And I actually have a long list of them right here. So, if you skip what is in bold, does it appear in bold here? But, Romans 6, In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God. Doesn't that make sense? In Christ Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes. 
Mm. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant procession in Christ. But even though without it, through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. So I thought, this in Christ thing is just attached all the time to concepts of what we are doing and concepts about what God is doing and what we should be doing. And I said, I'd like to see, look at that more. You know, I got stuck with that idea. So my sermon will be about in Christ. He, Paul says, in Christ, and then he adds a number of times in him referring to Christ. And one of the key, one of the passages of the Bible that really has a strong focus on this idea in Christ is Ephesians, the first couple of chapters in Ephesians. And it is about what God did for us in Christ. Ephesians 1 has these concepts. He chose us, he predestined us, he adopted us, we have redemption, we have forgiveness of sins, he lavished grace on us, he marked us with a seal, the Holy Spirit. All this happened to us in Christ. And the next chapter, he made us alive in Christ, saved us by, by grace, raised us up with Christ, seated us in heavenly realms, created us for good works, united the peoples, created a new humanity, all in Christ. And something I was thinking about when I read this, I think I have to read you a couple of paid, or passages properly from, from these two chapters. Because they are so filled with meaning, and maybe you have to read it a couple of times more just to get it all. 1 3. Praise be to God uh, and, and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has given freely us in the one he loves. Man, rich stuff. And from chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. In Christ, there is a new reality, there is a new story to tell. And my message today is not about the, the, the pol politics, or politics of the Adventist church and how we relate to this. I just want to say something personal to you about being in Jesus Christ. Something that I pondered about when I read these chapters in Ephesians over and over again was that 
I don't find here the arguments that Paul usually uses when he leads us up to understanding what we can be in Christ and the freedom and the salvation that we have in Christ. Because when you read, read Romans, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, and parts of his other epistles, he goes through the motions of talking about how we are no longer, we are not long, no longer seeking our righteousness through the law and keeping of the law. But we are finding something alternative that God has set up that is based on grace and the gift. And, and in these, these books, Paul takes us through these arguments so that we can understand and, and arrive at this understanding that we are new people before God. But in Ephesians, he just jumps all over these arguments and right into what he says, this is the new paradigm that we are living in, in Jesus Christ. We, as if he says, you don't really need to go through all those emotions to understand and see your own situation as a new person that has come into being in Jesus Christ. Let me just give you a little illustration about the argument as a journey and the destination as the conclusion. Right? Journey, destination, arguments. Conclusion. Next one. This is a motorcycle I bought sort of back sort of uh, eight years ago. Um, I liked it a lot. <laughs> I used to use it to drive to work on it. It had 150 horsepower. It could do zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. <laughs> and I wanted to try how fast it would go but I chickened out at 140 miles an hour. And uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't all. So it was quite fun. <laughs> fun to drive. I didn't drive that fast, but you know, the, the, the Autobahn in Germany, it's, a, it's legal. It's a wonderful <laughs> feeling. Just drive past a police car, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's the police. <laughs> you can only do that in Germany. Um, anyway. I picked this bike up in Berlin, because these are cheaper in Germany when, and then when I lived in Sweden. And I, was, I had 10,000 euros in my pocket in cash. I had my helmet in my hand. I had my driving gear, and my motorcycle gear in my bag. And I arrived at Berlin, took the train, met the guys at the train station who was selling the car, this motorbike, checked that it was okay, and started my journey back to Stockholm, which is quite far away, sort of 12 hours drive plus the ferry. And um, these guys, they made a, you know, they, they pulled my leg, they, they made a joke on me. And he said, you know, when you want to go northwards, it's a cloudy day, I didn't see the sun, I couldn't, didn't know where I was. So they say, just continue this road till you come to the motorway. And they sent me south. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And uh, so it took me sort of two hours to orientate myself and actually come back on track where I should go. They thought I probably knew the way. They were just joking. I don't know. Anyway, so as I came out of Berlin, it started to rain. And it rained all the way to Stockholm. <laughs> and um, a good bike like that has a night VC, and you, you, you know, but after a few hours, you get wet. You get wet, whatever clothes you have or whatever. So it was a long journey up through the woods of Sweden, trees both sides of the road all the way. And it's not fun driving a motorbike on the, on the motorway. They are built for you know, curves. Anyway, um, so um, sort of 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I was making this decision. If I go faster, it will feel colder, and I will freeze to death. If I drive slower, it will take longer, and I will freeze to death. <laughs> so at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I stopped at a McDonald's. That was the only place where I could get inside. I took my boots off, you know, in the bathroom, and was it wringled my socks up, yeah? And put them back on, and... Uh, and I went home. 
Uh, and I was thinking about this next picture. You know, that's not my wife, and it's not me. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, that's the sort of thing I was thinking about. Was, uh, All right, that was just an illustration about moving from a point to where you want to go. And um, in Paul's writings, you know, he, he takes us through all these discussions, and main, mainly with Jewish people who are so focused on the law, and he, he has to discuss all these things about becoming righteous this way or the other. But the destination is really what Ephesians is describing, and that is what we are in Jesus Christ now. Sometimes we preach the journey a lot, you know, the arguments, but, do we, but the focus is the destination, that is what is the consequence of what Christ has done for us. And then I read these marvelous things, which is quite abstract. You know, what do you understand when I read this? I read it again. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What does that mean? And in, the, in these two chapters, he describes a reality or something new that has come for those of us who are in Christ. I am not so sure that we need to always go through the motions of understanding all the stuff about sin. Uh, maybe that's an overstatement. But we have a tendency to focus the gospel is about sin, cleaning up sin, and doing away with sin. And guilt is the motivator to come to God. I'm also sure that is the only way to go there and to come to God and experience God. But, but in Christ, God invites us into a new reality, a new way of seeing ourselves and a new way of relating to other people. Let me tell you a, a, a short story. I talked to a friend of mine in Denmark in August, this August, and she told a story about um, a colleague of hers. This friend of mine was driving her car, and um, suddenly, just driving along the road, a voice spoke to her and said, you should call this colleague. And you know when that happens to you? I don't know. It hasn't happened to me many times, but it happened a few times. This woman is a, a, a really a woman of prayer, and she's very alert, trying to be very alert to the Holy Spirit. So she said, um, so she did. She, she stopped the car, called this colleague, and said to the colleague, I don't really know why I'm calling you, but when I was driving along, some voice in said to me, that I should call you. Then the call, the, this colleague started to cry and said, uh, just a few minutes ago, I prayed to God, even though I, even, I'm not a Christian really, but what should, you know, most people pray, even if they are atheists, you know, sort of thing, when, they, when things are wrong. And they say, so she, I, I, I prayed just a few minutes ago that somebody would call me and, or somebody would talk to me and help me because, and then she told the story about her marriage, which was on the rocks. And this colleague entered a new reality, a reality, a spiritual reality, with Christ. 
And she became a believer immediately. She didn't really know what that was all about. But she started to study the scriptures and go to a small group with my friend and brought her husband. There's a new reality, a spiritual reality. Another story. A few, few years back, I visited the cathedral in Coventry together with a study group from Fuller, Uni Fuller Seminary. And we did a study tour to emerging church uh, and church plants in England. And um, we met uh, actually one of the priests in the cathedral, which is not an emerging church. <laughs> uh, you could say that. But um, she said, once upon a time, I spoke to people um, the classic Christian message. When I met people, I, th I thought what they needed to hear was this. You are a sinner. You, know, you didn't put it that like that, but basically that was it. You are a sinner. You need forgiveness to come before God. You need to clean up your life sort of thing and, and also ask forgiveness. You will have forgiveness. Then you will be saved by grace. And then you will, uh, you're a saved person. And she said, no, not many people want to listen to that. So she said, I'm starting to connect to people about what they have experienced in their lives. And she, she told us as students there, she said, do you know, most people have experience in their lives that are spiritual. And most people have experience in their lives that connect them to something they don't understand. And they want to understand it. So she said, when I talk to people today, I say, I say what, have you, what have been your experiences in your life with something divine or something spiritual? And most people can tell stories like, I, well, I was in a car accident, I don't understand how we survived. Or they can say, I had a dream about an angel. Or they say that um, something happened in our family that I, I cannot explain, but uh, there was something there. And then she says, and I connect to that. And I say, I try to teach them what does the Bible say about these things. And you are actually on a road. You are, on a, you are moving towards spiritual things and you are moving towards God. Inviting them to go deeper into that reality. My main focus though, speaking about this to you, is... Are you a person who have come to experience that you are a new person in Christ? Do you see your life different now as you are a, as you are a Christian? And have, you, have the gospel impacted your life in such a way that you actually feel liberated? That you can see, say, I am saved. That you can know that you are living before God. If I use the words from, from Hebrews, that we come before boldly, before his throne. Do you feel like doing that? Are you free in your life to, to, to live in that reality? Because this is where I think Paul wanted to lead all his readers. He didn't want you to constantly think about the fact that you are a sinner and that you need forgiveness. You have to think about that. You know, don't forget it. And that's not what I'm saying. That is a part of our experience. But our experience with God is not only about guilt and sin and forgiveness. It is more and we can and, and Paul says that as we know Christ and we understand the goodness and the gift of, of salvation and the grace of God and the extent of his love that is higher and deeper and wider than we can understand, it, it is supposed to do something to our experience. It's supposed to make us into people who are liberated and can live free lives. Not disobedient lives, not lives that are, uh, you know. Not, that are not uh, conscious about our choices, but we can live as free, open, 
people. That is what Christ is doing to us. Do we celebrate? Do we know that we are saved, not only in the sense that we will come to heaven one day, but that we, today we are free people living before God and we are accepted as we are. This is a very important existential experience that Christ is offering to us who are spiritual people. How do you feel? when you are in Christ. How do you feel when you are in Christ? What, does it, what difference does it make? Maybe you should ask you, ask you to answer. Maybe you can share that in your group. Actually, that's some of my questions. Is it cool? Yeah, kind of cool. To... Um, have seen the goodness of God and taken it in. Are we free people? No condemnation, we say. That's the negative for those who are in Jesus Christ. Do you feel the freedom? Do we, re do we feel relaxed? Well, it's sort of dangerous to start to talk about this feeling, doesn't it? Kind of, where is this guy going? Do I feel relaxed? Before God, yes. Not careless. Just that I can live my life without constantly evaluating myself and asking whether I am right with God. I can live in liberty. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Can I relax to be who I am? Yeah, we are accepted as we are. Then we can enjoy stuff. We can enjoy just being, and we can enjoy doing good, and we can enjoy, enjoy blessing others. We are in a different place when we are in Christ. Quite a few years ago, I was in a Sabbath school class where we discussed something that I think comes up in Adventist Sabbath school classes, and that is whether we are saved. Can we say that we are saved? And the discussion goes back and forth, you know. Well, Jesus died on the cross and he paid the full price, yes. But there are some other things that need to go on and happen before. And you don't really know whether you are saved before you are actually in heaven. Because you might choose something else and you might go away from Christ. And then and all these arguments. Then there was this old lady sitting there. She hadn't said anything for the whole Sabbath school class. And she, she was sitting... Um, and she was kind of, um, her legs were quite weak, so, but she took hold of this chair in front and stood up slowly and straightened herself up. And then she said, I know I am saved because Jesus said so. <laughs> and then she sat down. <laughs> And uh, what more could you say? What more could you say? We are talking about Jesus, Jesus being all. And we can talk about that from sort of looking at the church and what we need to change. But I just want to remind you that Jesus is inviting you into a new life where Jesus is all and you live in him. And the fact that you can live and rest and be and have your being inside of what he has done for you 
and that he accepts you makes you into a different person. We are living in a different reality. I hope you will be there in that reality. May God bless us.